welcome to Bible Track Echoes, a ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher today is the director of Bible Tracks Incorporated, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample packet of all of our tracks will be given at the end of this broadcast. And now for our Bible study, here's our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. What a delight it is to be with you once again here at Bible Tracked Echoes. If this just happens to be your very first time to listen in and be part of our Bible study together, I say a very special welcome to you. Thank you so much. Now, right now, my Bible is sitting open to Romans chapter two. We are doing a series through the first three chapters of Romans. I'm in Romans chapter two. If you can pick up your own copy of God's word and open to that passage with me in your own Bible, Romans chapter two. Now, as we go through our time today, I will be encouraging you to get from us a free sample packet of our English gospel tracks. My announcer will give you three ways by which you can give to us your name and your mailing address. He'll do that at the end. So be ready, have pen and paper ready to jot down our contact information. I'm going to highlight one of our gospel tracks here in just a moment. But I want to lead into our Bible study time this way if I can. Have you noticed in the last, oh, five or ten years or so how the word feelings has been used a lot more? Everybody's concerned about their feelings. Now, some people use the word because they're concerned about their own feelings not being hurt. Other people are using the word because they want you to think more highly about them simply because they feel a certain way about an issue. Let me give you an example of the second kind of a person. There are some people who, well, you may know them, I may know them, but they feel badly about the issue of homelessness. They don't like it at all. They don't like it that some people have no place to live. That may be a laudable sentiment, but can I ask a couple of questions? Number one is this. Have you personally paid for a night in a hotel for a homeless person? How about this question? Have you gone out with food more than once to a homeless person on the street? How about this question? Do you regularly go to a homeless shelter and volunteer? Now, see, you see, if you say no to these questions, then I'm going to seriously question your feelings. Now, why am I saying all this stuff about the issue of feelings? I'm saying it because God cares about what we do far more than what we say or feel. Come get to Romans chapter 2 with me and let me show you what I mean. A moment ago, I spoke about getting a sample packet of our gospel tracts. Now, listen, friend, a gospel tract is an evangelism tool. It's a tool to help give the gospel to more people. A gospel tract is a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. And the one in my hand right now is entitled Ready to Die. Ready to Die. On the front cover, you're going to find a picture of a soldier there. It's about a man named James Dunkley. He was a born-again guy. He loved Jesus Christ. On a second tour of duty in Iraq, he was killed, but not before his life just powerfully impacted others. The title of this track, Ready to Die, came from the life of James Dunkley when he was just 14 years of age. He was serious in his walk with God, and he said, I want to be ready to die, not just myself, but live like that, and I'm going to share the gospel of Christ with others. He lived fearlessly before he went into the military, and he did his he did his role as a soldier in a fearless fashion. Here's a great gospel track just to read if you're a man, if you're a teenager, ready to die. By the way, at 14, he came up not only with his own life motto, but he came up with his own logo as well, and you'll find it in here. This track will impact people that are believers, but it leads directly into the gospel 
Do you want your life, do you want that of your young people to impact others? When Jesus comes, will he find us being faithful and living a determined life like James Dunkley? Get this track, please. Read it. Pass it on. And by the way, you can get more than just the sample packet. We'd love for you to order tracks and use them, hand them out, and see that the gospel gets to more people. If your Bible is open there to Romans chapter 2, I begin to read at verse 5. It says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for the glory and honor immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. We're going to stop right there. Now, I have read a little longer section than I typically do here. Verses 5 through 11 are the second segment of verses dealing with God's verdict on the morally upright person. They are trying to merit God's goodness by their moral uprightness. Back in chapter 1, we saw the list of sins done by those who are, well, we use the word pagan. There. They're openly rebellious against God. Their life is just one big rebellion against God. But as chapter 2 begins, the Holy Spirit is having a heart-to-heart chat with those people who live morally upright lives. These folk believe they are not under God's wrath because of the way they live. They don't need a Savior from hell because, in their own eyes, they're not going there. Verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2 confronts this morally upright person with the truth that they are just as guilty as the pagan man back in chapter 1. We saw yesterday in verses 1 to 4 that these morally upright people are inexcusable. That's the word used back in verse 1. But now, beginning at verse 5, 5 through 11 that we read, we learn that the moral man not only is inexcusable, he is also impenitent. He's impenitent. By that, I mean he refuses to repent of his actual sins. In verses 5 through 6, the moral man may look good on the outside to others, but God says they are treasuring up in their heart some trouble. They have a treasuring heart. This treasuring or this holding on to is treasuring they're doing is they're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath when God judges sinners. That's verses 5 and 6. They have a treasuring heart. But now beginning at verse 7 through 11, God puts on display two kinds of heart. Now, very frankly, friend, these verses 7 through 11 are not the simplest ones in our Bible to rightly interpret. We're told to look at one person who is seeking to do well, and then we are turned to see another person who does evil. Some well-meaning Bible believers have said that these verses teach that you can earn eternal life by your good works, but we know that that's not true. So what in the world are these verses, verses 7 through 10 in particular, what are they saying? I think the simplest way to understand these verses is that we are to see the hearts. Let's see what's in the hearts of these two kinds of people. In verse 7 and verse 10, those two verses, 7 and 10, we see a person with a hallmark and a hope. A hallmark and a hope. Their hallmark or the key quality of their life is that they continue in well-doing. This is not just a one-day issue or not just something they do on Sundays. This is the steady principle of their life. They do good because they have a hope. They have a focus. They're focused on the glorious eternal life. That's found at the end of verse 7. In verse 10, these folk are focused on receiving glory, honor, and peace in the life to come. 
verses 7 and 10 describe a person who lives with eternity in view, not their temporary earthly pleasures in view. This is the signal of a born-again person. They do good works. Why? They do it to display their relationship with God. But verses 8 and 9 talk about another person. Rather than continuing in good works, this person is contentious, verse 8 says. They live a life of fighting and strife. Now listen, they may not necessarily be fighting and have strife with other people, but they are contentious against God. God wants them to repent, verse 4 says, but they don't want to repent. They like their evil heart. Verses 8 and 9 are speaking about that moral man. Oh, yes, that outwardly moral man is viewed by society as being a wonderful person. He is the kind of person you want as your, well, your city mayor or your school board member. It's the kind of guy and person you want living next door to you. The problem, though, is that he is fighting God because inside, in his heart, he is doing all the same deeds that we saw listed back in chapter 1. This is a moral man, but he's unsaved. He does not obey righteousness, verse 8 says. In the moral man's heart is disobedience. It heaps on him God's indignation, God's wrath, tribulation, and anguish. All right, friend, we've just looked at two hearts. And they were told here that the moral man may look good, but he's treasuring up wrath in verses 5 and 6. Now we find out that there are two kinds of hearts. So what should you and I who are trying to love Christ, what should you and I take away from verses 7, 8, 9, and 10? Well, we had better be asking ourselves at least this question. Am I doing things to look good to men so that men will like me, maybe elect me mayor, maybe want me to live next door to them? Am I doing things to look good to men or am I doing things to display my love for Christ? Am I doing good things to try and hide my heart from others or because I'm doing good things to reveal my heart love for Jesus Christ? Jesus, he confronted some morally upright people in his earthly ministry. Do you know what he said to people that were morally upright on the outside but unsaved on the inside? He said, you people are full of dead men's bones. That's not a pretty picture, is it? You may be listening today. You're morally upright. You like people patting you on the back because you're a morally upright person. And I'm glad that you are. Come live next door to me. But friend, we're talking about eternal issues here. Your moral uprightness does not make you right with God. You have a wicked heart. You do in your mind, in your heart, the things that other people do openly, things that you condemn but you do them and you ponder them, you mull over them, you wish you could do them, but you don't. You're a sinner, you're unrighteous with God, you have a sin-stained heart, and the only remedy for that is not your morality, it's the shed blood of Jesus to die on the cross to pay for your sin. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes a ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of all of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. That's 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. A faster way to contact us is to go to our website at BibleTracksInc.org. That's BibleTracksInc.org. There you will find more information about our ministry and details on how you can support Bible Tracks Incorporated. Thanks for listening, and may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.